Hey folks, how you doing? Hopefully you are all having a great day today. It has been a year and six months or so since I moved into this shop, so I figured why not do a shop tour. It's basically the exact same setup that I initially had when I moved into this place. So I designed this layout before actually being in here with some tools for the most part. There's a few minor tweaks. For example, I got a uh, much larger horizontal belt sander and then my two foot by four foot CNC machine I upgraded to a four foot by 10 foot CNC machine. So there's some minor, minor changes, but it's basically the exact same workflow. So if you're interested in setting up a wood shop, my suggestion is to build it around the assembly table. I call it the workflow wheel, right? It's a whole wheel of all your stations with the center hub being the assembly table. So each spoke on the wheel is from the assembly table to a station. And that's the basic premise of this particular layout. So a couple bullet points before I actually show you everything. Number one, uh, I've been in business, I guess you could say, since 2012. 2011, I started making stuff to sell on Facebook and such, uh, Facebook Craigslist. 2000 and December 8, 2012, I uploaded my first video to YouTube. March of 2013, I created my website, which is the core of my business. And in August, August 22nd, 2014, I quit my full-time job to do this, Jay's Custom Creations, full-time. So I don't make things to sell as my primary source of income. The majority of the stuff that I make is for my own personal use or it's a gift for somebody else. I, I try not to get in the, the mental um, thought process of making stuff to sell simply because my business is not structured in that way. I make content for my website in video and article format and the goal of that content is to be somewhat either educational or inspirational to uh, that's th that's the main goal with this content and present it in such a way that it generates revenue So how do you make money online? My biggest suggestion is to go to smartpassiveincome.com. I'm probably not the best person to uh, to Take a deep deep dive into that topic So go to that website if you're interested in learning how to make money online that being said uh, I don't so, so I, I wanted to say that because I don't particularly do direct woodworking for a living I present woodworking for a living. There's a, there's a clean, a clear distinction there. Uh, that's number one. Number two, anytime I make with these shop tour videos in the past, of course, the funny comments of it's too clean, you never do anything. Do you ever do anything in that shop because it's too clean? Number one, I really like a clean shop to work in. I just think a clean shop is inviting. Number two, this shop does get trashed basically with every project. And number three, I'm making a video showing the shop. Of course I'm gonna clean it up. Uh, so with that out of the way, let me take you off the tripod and give you just a quick walk around so you kind of get a bird's eye view or a quick uh, glimpse of everything. And then we'll talk about the specifics. Okay, so starting from here, the door, I have some random storage on the right. The first tool island is on the left. There's a big walkway and opening to the CNC machine. So this is basically a large staging area. So if I put my back to the CNC machine real quick, see there's a lot of area right here. You could park, I could park my truck right here, uh, but that's mainly for staging and such. Let's go back to where I was. I'm trying to go slow so I don't make people dizzy going handheld. And then another kind of staging area over here. The back wall is for rolling items. They have to be rolling because that's an elevator that I made to access the loft above. Dust collector over there. And then this is the main working area, mainly the assembly table, also my workbench. And then the other side of this tool island, a large walkway over here. The other tool island wood storage on this wall and then we come around back to my homemade tripod it's not even a tripod it's a bucket pot i call it uh, so let me put you back on here spin you around and we'll talk about specifics let's start with the front wall of the shop the front wall has two large bay doors and i contemplated when i moved into the space blocking off one of them but I kind of like having the doors open on the rare days in Mississippi where the weather is just absolutely beautiful. It's not too hot in the, in the summertime or it's not rainy and cold in the wintertime. There's a, there's a few week stretch twice a year that the weather is just 
perfect here. So uh, take advantage of that, the, the doors roll up. So these doors were not original to the shop. I had those the metal, excuse me, metal corrugated roll-up doors and they were thin metal and they radiated a tremendous amount of heat. So this is not quite north. North is a little bit that way, which means the sun rises on a kind of a steep angle in this direction. And in the mornings, these get uh, the old doors were just baking heat and just pumping a lot of heat into the shop. So switching out to insulated doors was a huge win. These doors are, they're not the roll up kind, they've got the tracks. They're not in the way at all. Um, and they've got windows in them. So one of the decisions that I made was to spend the extra money for windows in here. And that was a great decision because as you can see outside, it's not a sunny day. So the exposure is not blowing out the outside. That's the back of my house and my driveway is over here. So as I'm working in here, basically no matter where I am, I can take a quick glance to the front of the shop and see if somebody has pulled in. So having the windows there, really really awesome and as far as like neighbors and other people looking in that's not really a concern at all uh, i don't work here at nighttime most often i don't work in here at nighttime so if, if it's nighttime where the you know the sun's down outside and you have a light on inside if you don't have anything covering the windows and it's extremely easy to see in big deal i don't care um that doesn't really happen that often so i do have a fridge in here uh, and this was kind of a happy accident in our last home, when we sold our last home, uh, we, they, they did not negotiate the refrigerator and our realtor said uh, that the refrigerator goes with us when we leave. And I, oh, okay, I didn't know that the refrigerator did not stay. So uh, we had just put this refrigerator in there because our last one died and we put an El Cheapo one in there and brought it with us. So that was really, really cool. I've got my air cleaner cart over here kind of on an angle and this is one of the good locations for it because this air cleaner cart is just a furnace blower motor that's got four filters all the way around it. It's on wheels so it rolls around easily. Uh, but it shoots the air up at like a 45 degree angle. So in that position, not only is it circulating air this way, but it's also circulating air this way. And I've tested a few different locations with that as well as, or I'm sorry, with my Dylos air quality monitor, which I'll show you in just a little bit. And with this, in this position, uh, it circulates air really, really well. So basically no matter where I put my monitor right next to a working station or away from a working station, I basically get the same, um, same readings with this right here. So this does a good job of really creating a draft and, and filtering out the air. Super easy project. I've got a video and an article on my website. Uh, you can check out search air cleaner cart. Maybe I'll put links at the bottom of this video and on the article. Uh, recommend it for everybody. I've made several of these. As a matter of fact, the last one I made, uh, me and a buddy of mine knocked it out in literally a half hour. It's just four two by fours for the corners with some rabbits on both interior and exterior sides. Uh, well, on opposite corners of the two by fours, I should say. And some plywood panels to make up the uh, the rest of the space and, and a blower motor. Super simple, super easy. I have my old miter saw on a mobile stand that I can take with me elsewhere, which has been super handy. I just don't have a place to park it all the time. That's my old miter saw that was super wore out and I took out of my miter saw station that I'm probably going to put right back in my miter saw station because the dust collection on the, the good saw that I have, the accurate saw that I have, is horrible. Uh, which I'll talk about that in just a minute. And then I have some carts. Let me just pull you around. That, that's probably going to be the best. But So this corner kind of stays as like a, a randomness of stuff that can continuously changes. Uh, there's no, nothing over here is permanent. Uh, for example, here's, here's a, a, a sink and a faucet for an upcoming vanity build that I'm making. Uh, this, this shelf does stay here. I've got some woodworking books and my epoxy stations over here and some overflow finishes down below. Uh, above the door, you can see I've got, I've got a lot of little personal touches in here because I like kind of, you know, this is my space. It's my, it's where I work, but it's really just, this is like my space and I want to make it mine and, you know, make it inviting for me. These are my dogs. My wife had these three painted for, uh, one of her friends painted it for a birthday present of mine. I thought that was really nice. So they get to stay with me. Uh, that's really, really cool. This is a just a regular inexpensive um, mechanics chest, tool chest. I guess we'll call it a tool chest because I'm not really a mechanic. 
but that was one of the better purchases that I've made because it got all of my like wrenches and sockets and sink drains, basically all my tools for my old maintenance job, got them all out of my um, miter saw station so that my woodworking tools can actually go in the miter saw station, which is nice. Miter saw station and storage wall. The only thing that I hate about this layout is this is way too far away from my workbench because I use my workbench for not only woodworking stuff, but if I've got a metal part to work on, well, I use it on my workbench or I work with it on my workbench and I wish this was a lot closer. So, uh, so there's that. The sticker cabinet, which is full of finishing supplies that I clean out and then it just gets junked again and then I clean out and then it gets junked again. So whatever. Uh, I've, I've embedded some magnets at various spots on these doors, specifically this door, so that the interior um, side of this one handled door latch, did, did that make any sense? The <laughs> non-latched door stays shut and I can just open one at a time. A little more convenient. And then let me just move you around a little bit more. Next to that is a cart that I use for my HVLP sprayer. An old cart that I made in my last shop. And this is a Fuji Q5 Platinum HVLP sprayer, which is way overkill for my actual needs. But it, uh, it, it's, it's the, the one that'll have all the capacity if I ever want to spray some thicker finishes or whatever. So I keep seal coat shellac in this gun and I can keep it in there for many 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 months and not worry about cleaning it out because shellac is a burn in finish it's going to burn into the layer below it as you start stacking layers on your project well the exact same thing is the exact same concept or process is going to happen in the gun if any build up happens around the needle as you spray spray it a little bit it'll start to clean it out I've never had any problems whatsoever about long-term storage of shellac in the gun. And I like it because I use shellac all the time, especially for little decorative items. Um, so, and I, and I have a, first off, the whole cart's on wheels, right? You see that the hose is wrapped up right here and I have the whole, the whole system on a, on a uh, wireless remote. So, uh, it's just a super, super, super convenient little station here. One of the things that I spray the most is little decorative, decorative items, like I said. And I used to take all of my scraps and glue them together randomly. Like if I have, you know, some downtime where I want to be physically active, I'd glue all my scraps together and start building up a stack of cutting board blanks. Well, it's kind of the same process, but instead of cutting boards, I'm making these, these decorative blanks that we can give out as gifts. Um, because when you start to deal with people who get, you know, a, a gift every year or two, like friends and family, well, you can only have one or one cutting board or so. Uh, so what we do, what I do, is I take all of my scraps and glue up these blanks, again, just like a cutting board, and I spray it all with shellac to seal it, and then I spray the front or the, the good side with, um, is it dye or is it ink? It's Marsh brand ink if I'm not mistaken it's this stuff right here is it ink spray stencil ink so I, I get this stuff spray stencil ink marsh brand really really good stuff and then I can spray it on the front and because this is ash which it's just ash looks so good next to matte black I love that combination you carve out a decorative message or whatever on the front side and you have a really 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 nice thing to give to somebody and because it's it's pretty thick with these scraps you can do two things you can carve a keyhole slot in the back so when you hang it it hangs flush on the wall or because it is so thick you can just give it like so and they have the option of displaying it on a shelf or something like that they don't have to hang it on a wall but that's my strategy with scraps and the spraying station that I keep going, uh, keep ready to use at all times. This big empty space right here was my office, I guess. I had my computer right here and my, um, my NAS, network, attach, network attached storage and a couple other things, my printer and such. Uh, printer started to get a little bit too dusty and then I started to have a bunch of times where I just need to run out to the shop for like 
four or five minutes of quick work at night and I didn't want to leave the house or if it was pouring down rain or if I just had a day of where I'm doing nothing but computer work, it doesn't make sense to heat and cool this whole space if I'm doing nothing but computer work. So at that point, I just made the decision to move the office back inside in my bedroom and it's worked out all right. It frees up some more space. So this is just whatever right now. Moving along, let me move this way. This is, whoops, just like my dog pictures above the front door, I've got flags up here because I'm initially from Southeast Michigan. So there's a bunch of Detroit stuff everywhere. And uh, there's that. This cart right here is the CNC cart. I made this entirely on the CNC machine. This is four sheets of half inch pine CDX plywood. So inexpensive, well, <laughs> nothing is inexpensive lumber and sheet good related in the past year or two. But this is a quick little cart that I can keep all my bits handy and random other stuff with the CNC machine and kick my mat around. It's, it's on wheels. It's tethered to the CNC machine. There's a, uh, I think I got a 15 foot tether on this, the power cord and the ethernet cable to connect to the CNC machine. This whole corner behind me, I guess you could say, is the CNC corner. So I have storage on the wall for uh, homemade clamps for the CNC machine and just random stuff on a magnetic board. Obviously, you're going to have that type of storage next to the machine. I've got a bunch of smaller offcuts that uh, are perfect for testing and such over there on the, on the corner. Uh, I've gotten quite a few questions about these two medallions. Here, I'll just bring you in closer. These medallions are, one is Marvel, one is DC. And San Diego CNC, I didn't make these. San Diego CNC. San Diego, you get it? San Diego CNC on Instagram. Uh, he created, if I'm not mistaken, he created these files as Creative Commons where you can download them and, and cut them and, and whatever you want to do with them, I guess. Um, but he, he sent them to me, which is really awesome. I'll, everybody who comes into the shop, especially like teenagers, they, they see it and they gravitate back towards it, like spotting everybody, you know, uh, all the superheroes. But anyway, that's, that's pretty cool. Of course, CNC art makes sense to keep next to the CNC machine. And before I spin around, let's see. So the CNC machine itself, this is a... Um, Avid CNC, it's a four foot by 10 foot. Avid CNC machines are completely modular. They're like Legos. If you want a bigger one, you can, at a later date, you can add on to it. You can make whatever type of hold down systems that you want. You can have, you can build your own vacuum table like Crafted Workshop did, Johnny Brook. You can do uh, dog holes and T-Track like I did so that you have basically unlimited, very precise locating for repeatability. I put a vertical table on the front of mine so I can do joinery on it. Uh, I taught a joinery class in here two weekends in a row, three weeks ago, two, two weekends in a row, three weeks ago, if that makes any sense. But with that vertical table, you can do all kinds of pretty cool stuff. Uh, so I this is a workbench prototype. I've got two pretty large tenons and there's the mortises with a couple screw ups, but that was a test fit. They worked really, really well. Um, and as you can see here, this is a half lap dovetail joint for the stretcher to the leg. Uh, again, a little test piece. This is all three and three quarters, three and three quarters of an inch square stock. And all of the joinery for this was done on the vertical table on the CNC machine. So uh, very, very, very capable machine. With the CNC, you're not, Something like this that's modular to where you can, you can have control over all of the work holding options. You're not limited to sheet goods. You're not, um, you're not what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you're not excluding sheet goods by going for like a setup for like solid lumber. Anyway, I really, really, really like this machine. And I just got the upgraded spindle that I've yet to install. So uh, a lot of cool stuff coming with this. And below it is just miscellaneous storage. Here's a fun, fun little fact for you or whatever. Fun little reference. This is my dad's old craftsman toolbox that he gave me years ago. And I'm going to give that to my daughter one day. But 
me back out so it'll focus on that maybe. That sticker right there is a WLLZ 98.7 Detroit Wheels radio station sticker. That's an old one. My daughter likes to come in here into the shop with me and tinker with all these old socket set and mechanics tools that are just jumbled into that little box. So she gets to play with that. She likes to play with these saw horses and hide little pieces of metal or nuts and bolts and washers. She'll hide them in those saw horses so that I'll forget about them. And the day comes that I need to use the saw horses, I'll pick them up, you know, pick it up and swing around or something like that. And then metal just goes spraying through the shop. Ask me how I know that. Um, but yeah, that's fun. <laughs> the back wall, you'll see Let's see, can you get both of them in here? These two mini splits, that one, that one. <laughs> I have a single compressor unit outside, compressor condenser unit outside that, that handles three uh, heads, uh, is that what they're called, or cassettes? There's two downstairs symmetrically placed and then one upstairs. Uh, in the center for heating and cooling. I think it's a 13, or I'm sorry, 36,000 BTU unit. Uh, it's Mitsubishi, works really, really well. That was one of my splurge purchases when I moved into the space. I'm gonna be here a while, just do it right from the first time and, and just cry once from the bank account the first time. And I did cry once when that happened because that was expensive, but super, super happy and pleased with it. The, the, the walls are insulated. I don't know if I mentioned it yet, but there's two by six studded walls uh, with uh, on 24 inch centers with six inches of fiberglass insulation in between. And then the, the ceiling, the roof, I should say, the interior of the roof has two inches of closed cell spray foam. Between those two, these mini split units are barely barely even running. They never get put on high. It just keeps whatever temperature you want to set it on. It's comfortable in the wintertime. It's comfortable in the summertime. And our light bill, our electricity bill, this is all attached to the house as far as the bill goes, is never ridiculous. It's about the same as it was in our last house, which was um, a two-car garage attached to the house. So this is pretty energy efficient. And also all of the light lighting in here is energy efficient. They're LED strips. Combined, all of the lights, I think, is a little over a thousand watts, which isn't that much when there's considering this space. All right, let's let's keep the camera here for a second, talk about some other stuff. The space itself, I didn't mention this yet, but left to right from this camera orientation is third inside wall to inside wall, 38 feet, I'm sorry, 28 feet, eight inches, and then this way is 38 feet, eight inches. So this, the structure itself is a 30 by 40 pole barn and the usable space is not 30 it's 28 feet 8 inches and it's not 40 it's 38 feet 8, eight inches um, I got one of those distance measurers that are uh, laser measurers and um, I just finally measured the other day to, to just to be sure so there's that uh, this back wall, everything on this back wall is on wheels for a reason, so I can move it around at the shop. This is stuff that I don't use all the time, uh, so I'd rather just not have a permanent setup location for it, but just kind of tuck it out of the way and then move it out as needed. I do use the dual press right there, but my uh, drum sander, this is a 16 by 32 drum sander. Now it's 16 inches because the drum itself is 16 inches, uh, but it's open-ended on one side, so you can put a wide up to... Uh, 32 inch wide tabletop through here, spin it around and then pass it through again. And that's why it's a 1632. Uh, but this is one of those things that it's incredibly handy, but I don't use it all the time. I've got a, a um, what's this, uh, six, 12 by 16 wood lathe, Laguna 12 by 16 wood lathe. I don't turn a lot of stuff. It's super, it's a super handy tool to have for the, the odd situation where I need to have some stuff turned, but I don't particularly turn a lot of stuff. I kind of keep all of my turning interest to just watching Frank Howarth. <laughs> um, I don't particularly turn much myself, but it's handy to have. Uh, this drill press is a one of my oldest tools that I have. This is a 13 inch central mach machinery drill press from Harbor Freight. It's a bench top one. It's, it's the largest bench top drill press I've ever seen. Uh, it does the job, and although it is 
really wore out, but it does the job. The base that it's on, that is a nightstand that I found in a dumpster back two shops ago when I was working at an apartment complex and then woodworking out of one of their empty units, which they actually rented now. Someone actually, someone actually lives in my uh, old shop, which is kind of funny. Um, but this is a nightstand I found in the dresser. It is 100% MDF, <laughs> veneered MDF, and it's held up quite fine. Um, I've had it through three shops now, and it's held up just fine. Uh, various stuff on the wall, like levels and such. I have, again, with the theme of making this space my own with my dog paintings and flags, I've got pictures of my daughter, which are, it's just so awesome to have this stuff in here. So this is when she was uh, just under two years old. She was sitting on a bench. And that was, and if you think about like getting caught up in the rat race of trying to have the latest and greatest uh, cameras and such and megapixels and all these camera specs, if you ever get into the like craziness of camera stuff, this was a 1.2 megapixel or something like that. It was one of the smaller settings on an iPhone. So this is very little data that I blew up into, um, I think this is 30 by 40. It's not 30 by 40. It's a huge photo though. So you don't need all the fancy megapixels and gigawatts or gigawatts or whatever they are. <laughs> and this photo over here, this one I love too. This is when she was um, just over a year, I think. And, and, and maybe she was just under a year, but this is here in the shop. She's got a matching apron that I have and it's, it's just really cool. I'm very proud of those pictures in here. Uh, going on this way, I'm sorry I keep moving you around, but this is just really convenient. This is my uh, Panto router cart. So I made the cart with the Panto router and everything, it's like a, a totally inclusive setup for this machine. I've got a uh, Clearview Mini CV06 Cyclone over here with a shop back down at the bottom. Uh, so it's all set up and ready to go with dust collection, all of the bits and accessories are even are nice and stored right there. It's on a really good set of casters, as you can see. I just moved it around, uh, locking casters. But this is one of those machines that, again, I don't want to have set up at all times because I don't use it at all times. Uh, but I can easily move it anywhere that I want in the shop and, uh, and then use it. So that's, that's nice. My clamp rack over there that is just a... It's a mess. I need to, I need to redo it or add, actually not redo it, but I need to get rid of the stuff in here, add some more of these arms in the middle for more longer vertical storage. My favorite clamps, by far, my favorite clamps are half inch pipe clamps. It's like the best ratio of inexpensive, lightweight-ish and clamping power. In, in a small little package. I can get these, what was it? It was a, it's been so long since I bought them, so maybe the price has changed. I'll, I'll correct myself if I say it wrong, but these clamp heads are just some inexpensive no-name brand from a local discount tool place that's not Harbor Freight. And I think these were $4 each, maybe they were $6 each, the set. And then you buy a 10 foot stick of half inch pipe from like Lowe's or Home Depot. My local Lowe's, the 10 foot stick of pipe was like 12 bucks and they'll cut it to whatever lengths you need. Uh, so I have them cut it into three, three, two, two. So you get four clamps out of one. And that brought the entire price. I think I did the math the previously to where this, the entire price of this was $8. And I think that's like the best bargain that I can find. Um, there's that. This corner I also have my uh, welder that I very rarely use, but it's super handy to have a welder on hand for like mainly like yard stuff that breaks because that seems to be the only stuff that I break that needs a welder. This is where I keep all of my hand tools in this shop. I wanted to build a nice decorative cabinet. cabinet. I still want to. I just haven't gotten around to doing it so they all live happily in kind of a state of organized chaos over here. I keep my 
um, grinder real close to it because I still use the method of using the grinder to establish the bevel and kind of an overall shape of the cutting edge and then using my diamond plates and leather strop to establish a sharp edge only. There's no use, uh, there's no sense in having the entire edge of the blade or the entire bevel of the blade contact the the, the diamond plates and strop uh, it's just wear extra wear and tear on that so fast to establish the shape and then just the edge to establish the cutting edge and it works really really well um a <laughs> little saw till this saw till is kind of funny it's a it's a saw till for hand saws and the till itself is just a very basic box but it was cut out in the cnc so cnc cut out Saw, hand saw till. I think that's funny. It's kind of, it's kind of punny. Funny and punny. Maybe. A little bit. This, on this wall, is my miter saw station. And I'm sure you're well aware what this thing is. So, this, I designed this in my last shop primarily for storage. I want, this is more of a storage wall than it is a miter saw station. Although it's got my miter saw in it. And it's got three different, four different levels. The bottom cabinets, the top cabinets, the cubbies, and the storage above it. So when I, I've developed a, a naming system for this, these, these cabinets uh, and that I used when I made the plans. So these are all the T cabinets, T as in top, B cabinets, B as in bottom. So sometimes like when a friend's here, I'll ask them to give me something or whatever, or they'll ask where something is, and I'll say, uh, T3 middle. And I just spit that out because that's where I'm thinking of it, but they have no idea what I'm talking about. So T3 middle is this, this drawer right here. T, the cabinets, one, two, three, T3 middle. T3 top, T3 bottom. And uh, anyway, that's a fun little fact for you. All right, I hit the recording time limit, so my camera shut off. So I gotta go back here and finish what I was saying. So basically, uh, what I said before the camera shut off is this this miter saw station was in the left corner of my last shop So this was a wall in my last shop and I designed it so that the bottom area would be an empty space a cabinet Empty space cabinet empty space and a cabinet back and forth back and forth so that I could have my air compressor cabinet trash can cabinet and then whatever storage down below when I moved into this space I obviously don't have a wall over here so I wanted to move this cabinet down to support the end of the upper cabinets and some questions of is this thing sagging in the middle and every now and then I'll look at it and think I'll catch the right angle and think man that is sagging quite a bit and then I'll get my big seven foot level put it across it and no, it's, it's actually not sagging at all. So this is kind of like an optical illusion or, or maybe it's just sagging up here, not down there. Anyway, uh, I don't think that this, well, I've, I've had this set up for a year and six months now, quite a bit of weight on the top. If, it's, if it was gonna sag to where it caused a problem, it would have already done it by now. Uh, but I don't think that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, if I change this shop layout around, which I've already created a SketchUp file to kind of consolidate all the open spaces in between the tools, but maintain the same uh, workflow efficiency. It's basically gonna be, if I change it around, it's gonna be the same exact layout on the opposite wall um, so that I get a much larger staging area. Uh, if I do that, then this corner of the miter saw station will actually be in the corner of the shop and I'll put it back into the original orientation. Uh, but that's that. I don't think not having a cabinet in the middle has caused any issues at all. Uh, so, in front of the miter saw station is my assembly table. This is a Polk table, P-A-U-L-K. Uh, if you're interested in a pretty cool design that is great for portability uh, and also great for features of actually working on a nice surface, then definitely check out Ron Polk. He has a uh, set of plans to make this Polk style table workbench. It's, he calls it a Polk workbench because yes, yes you are doing work, but I, uh, the way I explain it is my traditional woodworking workbench is great for both hand tools and power tools due to its mass. It's not really that great for large case goods or anything like that because it's not that large. Whereas this assembly table is what I call it, is fantastic for case goods and random assembly type of processes, but it's not 
fantastic for hand tool woodworking because it doesn't have a tremendous amount of mass and it is a hollow structure. So it bounces around a little bit if you start chiseling or something like that. So uh, I still absolutely love it for a, an assembly table. I have dog holes, as you can see. You can see all the dog holes in here. Dog holes versus T-Track. I, T-Track definitely has its place, but on an assembly table, I 100% prefer dog holes. Uh, my CNC machine has both dog holes and T-Track. Uh, but the reason I really, really, really like these dog holes is it gives you an infinite amount of work holding stops. And most of the time when I'm, when I'm working with stuff on a table like this, I don't need a T-Track to clamp something down. I just need a stop in place. So for example, if, um, if I've got like a rectangular piece, then I can put a dog in this direction to stop it from going that way and one dog in this direction to stop it from going this way. And then I can go from right to left with whatever tool I'm working on uh, with. So like a biscuit joint or, or a domino or something like that. All you typically need to do on an assembly table, for me anyway, is to stop stuff from sliding, not necessarily secure it. So I prefer dog holes and dogs versus top down um, clamps with T-Track. And I know there's all kinds of other accessories for T-Track, but it's just so much easier to drill a hole that never really gets messed up versus a T-Track that could potentially pull out of a surface. I really, really like this, this setup here, four foot by eight foot assembly table. Below it, I just have miscellaneous storage and a, and a battery powered cordless air compressor. Now, there's another thing to talk about. So um, when the battery powered brad nail guns became popular, uh, I totally jumped on that train and absolutely love the convenience of a, of a brad nail gun that's not tethered. However, they're heavy. Battery powered nail guns are heavy. And uh, I went through uh, a little bit of time where my right elbow was hurting me and using the nail gun was hurting me. So I went back to not using the battery powered nail gun and instead I got the just, you know, like the, the, the lightweight pneumatic nail guns and having a battery powered air compressor underneath the table at all times super handy and not having when you don't have to worry about um, wires going through it uh, so this miter saw i didn't i kind of mentioned it earlier but this miter saw is one that i recently added to this miter saw station and the saw itself if this was a wow this wide angle lens is really wide we're pretty close to this saw and it looks like it's a mile away um, this saw is, it's a Milwaukee something or other. I don't remember the exact model number. Um, it's a great saw for making good cuts in a portable setup where dust collection really doesn't even matter. In this setup right here where I'm emphasizing dust collection a little bit, it is horrible. If I, if I do switch the shop around and move this station, I'm putting my old wore out miter saw back into here because I would rather have non-accurate cuts that I could use as a rough cut to break down lumber. I'd rather have that and flawless dust collection than in this case, accuracy with horrible dust collection, just because of the way that I use this station. I don't, I've never really used this station as precise, accurate cuts. I'd save those type of cuts for, uh, to, I'd save those type of cuts for a sled on my table saw. I've just always preferred that tool for the task. Uh, so so yeah, I, this, this dust collection is so annoying. It sucks, and not in the fun, punny way of dust collection. It, it sucks. Uh, so moving along, let's talk about lumber storage. So let me get you a shot down the miter saw station to talk about lumber storage. So I have four stages of lumber storage. Well, five if you consider my, I've got some, a couple slabs that just kind of hang out wherever. <laughs> but as far as a board, right? If it can fit, if the board can fit inside these cubbies, so I think I have 16 or 18 inches inside the cubbies. These cubbies at the top don't go all the way to the wall, which is kind of convenient for, for like longer stuff that I rarely use, like weather stripping to go around my garage doors. If I have extra, which I do, there's no sense in throwing that away. And it's kind of convenient to just toss it back there and, and leave it back there. Not really convenient, but that's just a good place to store it. But the reason I did not put the cubbies all the way to the back is I knew that these cubbies, if they were all the way to the back, stuff would get buried in the back and I'd never use it and it'd just be lost. So preventing my, by, by pushing this forward, I'm preventing myself from losing 
losing stuff while also gaining two layers of storage. So if my lumber is less than that, these offcuts, I'll put these inside the cubbies up here out of the way. If it is, for example, longer, let's find a board that actually is longer. <laughs> if it's longer than the cubbies and it sticks out too far, well, then it can go on top and you can see it'll go back to the wall on top. So there's two different kind of lengths of storage and that's convenient to not to, to not fall into the trap of stacking stuff on top of each other until you get some small stuff and it just gets buried and then it becomes a problem. So if it's too long to fit up here, then it goes onto the horizontal side of my lumber rack. Now I just changed this around recently. So this is kind of new. I used to have this entire wall over here as horizontal storage and it was so annoying to need the bottom one or to need the board on the bottom, or simply you just don't even use the board on the bottom because I don't want to deal with that. I'll just do some, use something else. Then you have wood that you're not even using. If you're not going to use it, why store it? So uh, if it's longer than say three feet, if it's in the three feet to four, four and a half foot range, then I'll put it on here because these are spaced on 24 inch centers. So there's a good example of how long this stuff is. Uh, it, it can get stacked on top of here. And if it's longer than these, then it can start to get stacked vertically over here. I recently moved all of my long stuff vertical. And that was such a good move because now I, I had a pile of horizontal lumber that was this high. Now it was all ash. It was all cut from the same log. So it's all gonna be primarily the same, but there's definitely good boards and bad boards in that entire batch and having them stacked real high and they're kind of heavy, you're basically stuck, of, stuck at taking the stuff off the top. So I moved it all vertical and it actually takes up less space. Uh, I still have to, I just did this recently, but I still have to come back with some type of chain to go come across the front because while yes, these are all leaning towards the wall, I spun them around, made sure I put the leaning direction towards the wall. Uh, I still don't want to have my daughter in here, you know, bumping into one of these and then a bunch of stuff comes crashing down. So a safety chain is definitely a must. I just haven't gotten around to doing it. But now at, at all, all times, basically, I can access all of my lumber and look at all of my boards. For example, I took the time to say, I know that I'm going to build a new dining table. Um, <laughs> I say soon, but it took us, it took me two years to get one in the last house. But I want to build a nice ash, curly ash dining table. And this batch right here, this section right here is all quarter sawn. So the uh, beautiful curl, all this ash is curly ash, it's beautiful, is gonna be good for the dining table. Whereas in this, as you can see, you got a lot of curl on the sides of the board. Maybe you can't see, maybe you can, you can't. So this is a little bit more rift sawn stuff. So I can organize it a little bit better and at any time very easily look at all the sides of the board. So. Vertical is the way to go if, if you can do it. Uh, then I got some other species of wood in here too. I do have, that I mentioned slabs. I've got a couple slabs over there uh, that are for stuff that I don't think I'll ever get around to doing. <laughs> I, I, this is a pecan crotch slab that's got some curls, got some bark inclusion. It's got a lot of awesome features. It needs a couple bow ties in it. So that would make a fantastic table, maybe some hairpin legs, maybe something else, I don't know. And I want to use it as a coffee table. My wife says no, I don't, she doesn't want the natural wood look, the no live edges, none of that stuff. So eh, I'll make something out of it soon. And then I have plywood stored vertically over here, which I've done for a long time. Opposite of that, or on the other side of that in the corner is my two aluminum ladders. I've got a 20 foot extension ladder and then an eight foot step ladder. So this, this corner just got really organized and tidy recently. Let me move you a little bit more so we can hit the last part, which is this last door. I think I started at the doors, right? Refrigerator, I've got a, I've got a, a generator for the house that I keep here in the shop that way. I've got a reminder set on my phone every two months to run the generator for five minutes just to keep it, keep the carburetor from not gumming up, you know? I don't like, um, engines to sit for for more than a couple months so i run all my stuff every two months and it's just super convenient to have this here in the shop i can open the door roll it outside run it uh, rather than in my garage because i like a real clean garage with not a bunch of clutter uh, 
So there's that. Let me restart the camera because I know it's got a habit of dying. And we'll talk about the islands in the middle. This is my view of the shop a lot. Uh, behind the table saw, this is the one of the tool islands. Uh, 52 inch rip capacity saw stop table saw. It's the PCS. It's the three horsepower, not the five. I don't need a five horsepower table saw. Um, and I have the uh, I have a lever router lift, homemade router lift in the wing. I have a cast iron router table over there, a dehumidifier, two trash cans. It's kind of this little island. Two trash cans, one for actual trash, one for burnables. Separate them like that because honestly, most of the wood that makes it to the burn bin doesn't actually make it to the actual burn bin outside. It makes it to my smoker, my grill. Uh, so it's nice to have them separated. Uh, I have a homemade router table here, which I typically only use for a real big, beefy flush trim bit. It works really, really well, but I have it dedicated for a flush trim bit most of the time. Then I have a, I did some work with Rockler, and that is the Rockler cast iron top, the the pro lit router lift, nice fence, dust collection, cabinet, the whole kit and caboodle. It's a really, really nice setup. So it's just precise and all right there and super, super convenient. So that's the primary router table station. And I just designate this for roundovers basically. Uh, I have a dehumidifier right here that is set. It's running right now. You can probably hear it. But it's set on a, um, a certain humidity level. So the humidity level in the shop stays comfortable. I live in Mississippi, which is like probably like Portland, Oregon. It, it rains a ridiculous amount. In the summertime, I like to tell people the weather is like hot soup. It is sticky the instant you walk outside in the summertime. And it's, it's, it's year-round humidity here. So in the winter time, when the heaters are running, there's nothing to take the moisture out of the air. So that's, that's when this thing gets used a lot. In the summertime, the air conditioners are running. Well, air conditioner, it conditions the air. And it does that by two things. Number one, it reduces the temperature, lowers the temperature. Number two, it pulls the humidity out of the air. If you have a properly sized unit, it'll pull the humidity out of the air. So those pull a lot of the humidity out of the air. And this thing barely runs in the summertime. Fun fact, the last owner of our house, our current house, the person who built this shop, it's only like a six-year-old structure, something like that. But the last owner built this for cars. He was a car guy. So he had a metal ceiling in here. Everything was black on around the perimeter. It looked like, it looked like a really cool car garage. But he wanted the option of washing the vehicles inside this space. So right underneath the router table right here, which is dead center of the shop, is a drain in the floor. It's just a gray water drain that goes out to the side of the property. Uh, so it's super convenient to just set the dehumidifier next to it and run a garden hose to where it sits right on top of the drain. And I never have to dump any buckets for the dehumidifier, it just continuously drains. That was a super awesome, uh, happy accident with this particular space. That was really, really cool. Uh, next tool island is over there. This tool island has all, is, is all the tools back to back to back, so it's, it's accessible all the way around, so we'll, we'll walk around it. But this is a Laguna 18BX bandsaw, and it is a resaw station, a ripping station. I keep a, a tapering jig on it just because I don't have a good spot to store this tapering jig, so it stays on it. And the, the first day this saw was set up, I put a Laguna resaw king is that what they're called i think maybe they're maybe they're called something else it's the laguna carbide tipped bandsaw blade uh for resawing and and this blade has been on here for i think it was october of 2018 when i got this and it's march of 2021 when i'm recording this video so two and a half years ish over two years that i've had this this blade has been on it and it still cuts amazing. It, it just hogs through some material. I've put uh, 14 inch wide babinga on here and cut up some veneers on it and it just chewed through it like nothing. So the power's there, the blade is long lasting and it's a carbide tipped bandsaw blade. So if it wears out, you can get it resharpened. Um, I've only had to clean some pitch and resin off it. And then also I cut some, I cut a glue up that had, I was, I was, I was gluing some inlays, CNC inlays together and it was a pocket of wet glue on the inside that I didn't really see. And I cut right through all that wet glue and it gummed up the side of the blade. I had to scrape the side of the blade with a razor blade to get all that crap off of it. But other than that, I've had to do nothing to this blade, not sharpen it at all. And it still cuts 
phenomenally. There's 16 inches of resaw capacity. Uh, it has two dust collection ports down on the bottom and then one right here. And as you can see, may or may not be able to see, there's dust everywhere because dust collection on this saw isn't good. And I, I don't know if it's the saw itself or if it's because this is a crazy aggressive blade that's got carbide teeth, so it's gonna be removing a lot of dust. But the instant, if you got a wide board right here, the instant you start touching the blade with dust, with, with, uh, with wood, it throws dust backwards away from the blade. So it just throws dust everywhere. So I'm, I'm not really too concerned about dust collection. You just kind of accept it for what it is on this saw. Uh, it's a good saw that I really like, but I hate the fence drift how flexible the fence is at the backside. So this is one of those fences that can slide out and let me move the camera around a little bit. It's one of those fences that it can get really close to the blade in this orientation for thinner stuff, but it slides out of the bracket there and then you can rotate it around. So it goes vertical like this for resawing. The problem is due to the way that this little T-square style connection point is on this metal rod, the back side over here is crazy flimsy. And it's kind of like the same setup as like a Beesmeyer style T-square style fence for a table saw. If you push the back side of, the, of a table saw fence in that style, it's gonna deflect a little bit, basically no matter what. But on a table saw, the majority of your pressure should be downward. The primary pressure should be downward, secondary pressure up against the fence. So you're not really putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the fence of a table saw fence. On a bandsaw fence, I'm pushing it up against the wall the way I, the way I use it anyway, especially if I'm using rough sawn lumber that doesn't have a flat bottom. I'll push it up against the fence as I'm resawing. And as I'm moving my hands back and forth, I noticed like the cut quality was starting to be a little bit wavy. Like what in the world's going on? What it ends up being is this fence is just flexing out at the backside. So I keep an extra F style clamp on the saw at all times. And uh, I put the clamp down on the table on the backside of the fence. So it physically can't go anymore that way. That's my only complaint with the saw, um, which is easily remedied by that, uh, that clamp right there. So, Oh, and the, the uh, mobile base on it, the way that it attaches to the saw allows for the mobile base to flex a little bit. So it works, but I don't really like the mobile base that much either. Let me move you around to the back side over here to show you something that's non-woodworking related. <laughs> I got a set of rings that I keep attached or out of the way right here. Some body weight gymnastics rings. I lost 40 pounds uh, in, 2000, in 2020 just from nutrition alone, not, no exercise at all. And I've been incorporating some body weight exercises hanging from the trusses in my shop. So if you've seen these in the videos and have wondered, I just like to hang around in my shop a little bit, literally. So I put one right there, one right there, and they're kind of out of the way. So there's that. Next up is a very welcomed addition. One of the things that I wanted to uh, upgrade when I moved to this shop was my sanding situation. And I got some, some nicer random orbit sanders. I already had a drum sander and I got this belt sander. This is a Hammer HS950. And you know, I make videos and content for a living and you see everything that I work with, right? Well, if there's ever a tool that, that if there's a ratio of amount of use versus amount of airtime, if there's ever a ratio where it gets, it's used a tremendous amount versus uh, seen the least, this is the tool that has that highest discrepancy. I use this machine all the time for all kinds of completely random stuff, sharpening axes, grinding off a little piece of metal on some other stuff. Uh, if I cut some big pieces, big chunks of threaded rod, uh, there's no need to use a file to, to get the uh, edges deburred or whatever, just a little, couple little seconds on this, this belt. You can get belts for metal, for wood, for other abrasive, for other situations. Um, I use this for rough stuff like that. I use it for precision stuff because this thing has a precision miter gauge here with a bunch of detents for different angles. So once you dial it in at 90 and there's a fine adjustment to really, really dial it in, once you get it dialed in, uh, it's trustworthy to, like, it, you can 
get some crazy accurate corners off of this machine, like, like box sides, right? So if, if I'm dovetailing a box and um, the, the dovetails are maybe just a little bit proud to sand them down nice and flush, you can do it all on this. You sand one face and then put the new sanded face up against the registration of the, uh, the miter gauge, this fence right here, and then work your way this way. So whatever face is coming off the sander, that's the face that goes this way. And you keep rotating that around like that, and you get a very, very, very precise 90 degree, 90 degree, 90 degree, 90 degree box all the way around. This thing is super, super handy. And there's a lot of features with this. I haven't done kind of a tool talk on this, this sander just yet, uh, but there's so many features with it. Uh, the, the, the belt is oscillating. But the table itself, whoops, if I unlock it, the table itself lifts up to access another area of the, um, of the belt. Anyway, uh, the, whole, the whole belt itself is on a set of trunnions just like a table saw, so it'll go back to horizontal. Uh, all that stuff over here can be removed, so you can put a big door up here if you needed to put a big door up here. I use this thing all the time and I barely ever show it for whatever reason um, so there's that let's talk about dust collection on it so I have this guy set up right here this is a Rockler roller stand I put a chunk of wood in it and then screwed on one of these big gulp dust hoods and I put it in such a way that it can tuck in real close to the factory shroud. So I have two four inch hoses going to this thing when I use it. Let me get this out of the way. The factory dust collection shroud is here and this can be lifted up out of the way. This, this stop block can be removed. So then you have unobstructed access all the way across to sand, which is pretty, pretty, pretty nice. Let me move this back to where it was and then I'll swing the camera around. We'll talk about the uh, hoses and such. So the hoses, uh, these, these two machines are ran off these two flexible hoses. I have a six inch, I'll talk about all the dust collection stuff at the end. I've got a six inch port, six inch pipe that breaks down into two fours. And each one of these fours has one of these really long expandable dust right hoses on it. Uh, and I keep one basically on the factory uh, side of the sander at all times and then this other one is down here at the uh, jointer planer combo machine and this I use for the jointer planer combo and then also bring it up here as the second one for the, the sander but these hoses are something that I get a lot of use out of because I have attachments for them to sweep up the shop or vacuum up the shop so with this man this wide angle lens is distorting everything this looks huge <laughs> this I can vacuum the floor uh, and pick up dust basically wherever and I can also uh, use this attachment to brush surfaces see how beat up that is I've gotten a lot of use out of that one I'm missing a bunch of the bunch of the stuff I've abused these over the years but I like this whole setup of, of the quick handle and the cleanup uh, attachments for the Rockler dust right hoses and I'm not being paid to say that I really like them I've had them for many years so I'm not being paid to say anything by the way um, this is a hammer a341 jointer planer combo machine and I really 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 like it so I did a long video on this dedicated to this machine it is a 16 inch wide helical head or spiral head. No, it's a helical head, uh, carbide insert jointer. And then you take the dust collection handle over here. You bring the fence up to three inches or less. Flip these up, flip this over dust collections ready to go and now you're in planar mode so now it's a 16 inch wide planer of course the table's down below you got to bring the table up that's that's one of the biggest complaints with this machine is it takes a full minute there's no way to get faster in, in my opinion it's just a full minute to go from jointer planer back and forth back and forth back and forth and for somebody like myself who doesn't do production work i value the capacity more so than i 
then I would value two independent machines where I didn't have to constantly change back and forth. So you, you get greater capacity and as a jointer, 16 inch wide jointer, and then also you get um, the added bonus of decreased floor space take up for two machines. And then when you're done with an, in planer mode, drape the dust collection over there, pull the tab down, tables come down, get locked into place. The handle on this makes it really easy to not have to go to the back side of the machine to get back into jointer mode. So I really, really like this machine, jointer planer combo. Uh, and then we're back over to the front side of the bandsaw. Let's talk about dust collection really quick, because I don't think I mentioned that at all. I'm gonna spin you around. This is the Clearview EF5 Cyclone Dust Collector with their Clearview stand, just a generic barrel on it. And then all the piping in the shop is Nordfab piping, which is definitely expensive, but if, if it's within budget, it's totally worth it. If, if I've had to move some stuff around, uh, specifically when I got these bigger CNC machine running a new pipe, and it was just so easy, so convenient to disconnect the old stuff, add my little junctions in between, kind of tweak everything. It's way, way, way easier than messing with PVC or, or any other thing that I've messed with previously, which is basically just PVC. This dust collector is fantastic. It does a really, really good job. It's like uh, I forget the CFM rating off the top of my head, but I know it's, there's two different ratings based upon the impeller that you use. This is the 16 inch impeller, and you also get a different CFM rating inside the Cyclone depending on the intake you use. This is a six inch intake. Uh, they also have a fitting for an eight inch intake. So if you have a, a large run of piping to go in two major directions, you can come off of the, the main Cyclone with an eight inch section and then branch it off into two sixes and then branch it off down into fours when you get to your tools. Uh, but this, this, this dust collector has worked really, really well. I do have a working relationship with Clearview, so I'll have a coupon code for you guys to use if you'd like to purchase one of these units. Um, never purchase anything online because someone says so. Just do your research, and if that's the one you want to get, then, then get that one. Um, but dust collections, let me show you the piping itself. So, so the main run of pipe is right at the top of the screen. It comes out, and then it immediately takes a turn to the blast gate over the um, miter saw station. Then I have the main run continue, and then it comes off to this side to drop down to this tool island and go over to the CNC machine. And then the last little bit comes down all the way over here at the table saw to come down to a floor sweep, and then also a blast gate over here that runs the table saw and the uh, router table areas. Blast gate locations. I am a fan of having as many blast gates as possible right next to one another. Uh, the reason being is uh, if I need to switch from using the bandsaw to the joiner planer combo machine or, or something like that, if I'm switching tools, then I'm obviously gonna close one. Mine is, it makes more sense to close one and have the ability to open one relatively close, if at all possible. Also, like the CNC machine, that's a long run to the CNC machine. It doesn't make sense to have the blast gate way over at the tool when uh, that's going to create a lot of added strain on the system when the tool's not in use. All that doesn't need to be pressurized when that tool's not in use. So I put the blast gate up there while I can't reach it. I've got a stick that I spray painted a high visibility color and taped a set of magnets to the end of it. So this is just here at all times, and I can open and close the blast gate with the stick and then put this back up here. So it's a super handy, I don't have to be able to touch the blast gate, just open and close it with a stick, that'll work. I do have another stick over on top of my miter saw station. So with that same concept in mind, this blast gate shouldn't be right there. I should actually have that blast gate right up here with a metal stick, or metal stick, with another stick and magnet over here that I could open and close it so I could reduce that much strain on the system. However, I put this one in first and wasn't thinking about it, and it wasn't until after I added the extension almost a year later uh, that that particular concept dawned on me. But I still can't reach it where it's at now, so I have, I have a stick that has a notch on the end of it. 
You see that, right? There's a notch on the end of that stick. And it grabs the, the blast gate so I can open it and close it with no problems from standing over here. So that's, that's pretty cool. I can't remember if I mentioned the lights or not. These are all LED lights. These are American green lights. Um, they, there's three main rows of lights. So there's one dead center of the shop. There's one on either end of the shop and all those main rows have 90, 96, 94, I think it's 94 watt, 48, 96, 96 watt LED lights. So they got four strips in each one. So that's 96 watts, that's 96 watts over there. Um, and then there's little filler lights, like you may or may not be able to see this little filler one here, one right there. Uh, there's a couple on that side over there, those that are just 24 watts. Uh, this is all designed by a lighting professional and to, to get the most, or to get not the most, to get an appropriate amount of light on the surface. So obviously woodworking, you want to see what you're doing. You want to see the, the, the work properly. But that being said, what I'm, you know, this shop is also a studio. I want to have good lighting and all that good stuff. So lighting in here, I put some emphasis on that. It works really, really well. I do have three retractable cord reels kind of strategically placed throughout the shop. This one right here is right above my assembly table and it gets used the most. These are all 40 foot, 40 foot 12 gauge uh, hose, um, hose reels, extension reels. And they work well, but right there, so. I think the, ho the, the, the uh, cord is a little bit too thick for the housing. So if you, don't, if you don't have it winding up perfectly back and forth, evenly distributed on the reel, it'll bind up. If too much gets off on one side, it'll bind up and you'll have to pull it down and figure it out again. Um, I don't think that's a huge big deal, but there's that. And then I also have one more hose reel in between the garage doors. And I have this one set right here, not to actually work in here mainly, but if I have the garage door open and I need to get power out in the driveway, that's what I use this one for. Which, there we go. It's got to go on that side. I also have one of those on the porch of my shop. I'll show you a picture of the porch of my shop, which is right through the man door. And actually, you know what? Let's just take you for a ride. So out on my porch, I have a tricycle because who doesn't have a tricycle? And I've got a nice, I say nice hammock. I like the rope kind. And then I have a little outdoor kitchen type of a space. Uh, a couple grills and a picnic table. Nice little, nice little place to grill a steak for lunch in the middle of Summertime. On this back wall, I forgot to mention the elevator that I just made. So let me, let's see, can you see it? Oh, also this light bulb is of, a, of importance. Um, this elevator goes up to my loft above. I, this shop has a 16 foot by 20 foot loft above, which is great for storage. I actually put my office in there when I first moved into this space, but going up and down was kind of inconvenient. At the time I had a set of stairs that went this way. Anyway, um, so this light bulb, I wanted to be able to know exactly when power was on to the lift so that when kids are in the shop, which is very, very rarely, I would know at a moment's notice that there's no power to the lift. So if I flip the breaker, you'll see that light gets turned on because that light is plugged into the same uh, dedicated receptacle that the lift motor is plugged into. Uh, so that was my way of letting myself know that there is or isn't power to the lift. This is a homemade elevator that I made. Uh, it's working out really, really well. I'm going to grab the camera and we'll go for a ride. It's actually much easier to use my cell phone, so that's the route I'm going to go. I'm going to use my cell phone, but I used this seven-foot level on the wall, kind of strategically left it there. 
so I can use it to turn the lights on or off from the floor in case I forget to turn the lights on upstairs or off upstairs I can do that so let me switch over to my cell phone and now we'll go for a ride So this is just a kind of an awesome space to store stuff that you don't have to have cluttering anywhere else like Christmas decorations and empty boxes and such. Uh, it's really convenient to have this much extra storage space and putting this, uh, putting this elevator or this lift in here has really made it a lot more convenient, a lot more convenient. Oh, here's also a, a something I did not mention. In my last shop, the breaker panel for the house was inside the garage. And from the wall breaker panel in the house, uh, I did not have a lot of, I, I kind of did have a lot of storage in there, extra, extra circuits. But what I wanted to do was keep the whole shop separate. So what I did is I put a 60 amp breaker in the last uh, uh, breaker panel of the last house and put a like a six gauge wire going down to a stove outlet in the bottom of the wall and then from there that stove outlet plugged in to and it powered another sub panel which is this one right here i had this in my last shop mounted to the wall outside of the walls kind of tucked away and then from there i could run some of this wire on on the outside of the wall to the various different tools so when i moved to this shop all i had to do was pull that panel off the wall and unplug it from the wall and take all of my electrical stuff with me to this shop so i did the same thing here that panel down there on the wall the, the one for the shop did not have a tremendous amount of open space um, and i wanted to run some new stuff dropping down to the different tool islands so i did the exact same thing i plugged in my old my breaker panel to the other one it's on like a 60 amp breaker and from here, I've got some drops that go down to the different tool islands. So these, this panel here has the individual breakers for all the circuits on the tool islands. But with one flip of a switch, if I've got you know kids coming into the shop, I can go to that breaker and turn off this whole sub panel, which turns off all of the major power tools with one 60 amp breaker over there. So that's a kind of a handy little thing that we did in the shop. I think I covered everything in this video. There's a lot of stuff in this space. Um, I have really, really, really enjoyed the work that I've put in making this space what it is and uh, it's really cool to be kind of sharing it with a lot of other people now because more so than ever in my woodworking journey i've got a lot more people more frequently visiting the shop to learn something or to do something or to help somebody out over here or, or whatever and this is this is my happy place and i i really really like it hopefully you found some of the stuff useful maybe the layout maybe some of the tool options or something i don't know uh, if you have any other questions, just let me know. Send me an email, jayscustomcreations at gmail.com is the, just the most easy one for me to, uh, to get to. Leave me a message on my website or maybe this YouTube video. And that's it. You guys take care. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you in the next video.